Ron Paul versus the New World Order Whether Ron Paul is believed to be autonomous and outside of the New World Order's grand plans, or believed to be controlled opposition, operating within the auspices of the rich elite's network of total global control, no one alive now can deny that Ron Paul represents a change to the tone of rhetoric and the vocabulary of the conversation in the MSM and among the globalist rich elite in their planning bodies and steering committees. To resort to a gross metaphor like those thrown up as straw men, hollow arguments made by conspiracy researchers and conspirators alike, Ron Paul is to the rest of the people in his financial and socio-political class a lot like Rain Man, the autistic card-counting character played by Dustin Hoffman. They find him so incredibly annoying, they want to beat the shit out of him. And the only use they can see for him would be in gambling to fix their fiat credit-based economic system, which is already a useless wreck anyway. Nevertheless, Ron Paul has 100% of the populist support to not only sweep the Republican nomination and the USA's 45th presidency, but to lead a full-fledged revolution against the New World Order if he does not win through democracy. The only really serious question worth asking about Dr. Ron Paul is, do his citizen militias outnumber or outgun the private military contractors and ICE agents tasked by the New World Order to man the FEMA camps? The answer to this is the ultimate extent of and the real bottom line below all the rest of this, which is all only icing on the surface compared to this meat of the cake? The answer is yes, obviously, 100% he does. The Tea Party can arm Occupy and easily overthrow the NYPD, ICE, Blackwater, etc. The targets for such a coup d'etat would be obvious as well, and we would see the heads of state roll down the marble hallways of justice as the great wheel would turn in our own lifetimes. The only better question than can a real revolution in Ron Paul's name be accomplished even without him is what would it take to convince Ron Paul to lead Occupy and the Tea Party to unify if he loses the Republican nomination to Mitt Romney? The answer to that question I cannot speak on since I do not know it. If it were necessary, could Ron Paul, the modern day Thomas Jefferson of our era also embody a modern George Washington and step up to lead a real, ultimately global, revolution against the New World Order? This question deserves serious pondering at this moment in history, before the Republican National Convention, where all the bound delegates allocated to Romney in the MSM will be declared unbound and change their vote to Ron Paul. This seems like one of those historical, now or never, type moments for Ron Paul and his Paulite movement, among who I would definitely wish to include myself. And even though I am fully confident we will all make it through this tedious intermezzo period before the RNC itself, we are still daily dealing with oppressive MSM ignorance, police brutality, and internet censorship on Facebook and YouTube which recently even went so far as to cancel the account on which most of Ron Paul's videos were posted. It makes the anticipation for an event to come in the later half of this year all the greater to know that even with all this that is going on now, we are still only in the calm before the storm to come. Ron Paul himself does not seem to choose to predict outcomes in his own favor very often. He is optimistic at heart, but has a very pessimistic and critically thinking mind. He wants to believe that, by implementing the Restore America Now budget plan and issuing executive orders to restation all the foreign deployed service people in the U.S. military and to repeal the Patriot Act, he can wave a magic wand and correct the course of history. However, is this frail-looking septuagenarian alchemical economics wizard truly capable of facing down the devil behind the New World Order's master plans? 
Ron Paul often quotes the Old Testament scripture of 1 Kings, the book of Samuel, where in the diaspora of Hebrews following the Exodus and conquering the Canaanites of the Palestinian Holy Land, turned to their generation's high priest and prophet Samuel and weighed heavily upon him to appoint a king for them all to serve under as one people, under one man. And Samuel repudiated the Hebrews and said to the effect that if you have a king, he will impose taxes and you will suffer all that follows under such a system. The reason Dr. Paul quotes this scripture in speeches is that it is from the tenth book of the Bible, the first chapter of that book, thus 10.1, the same as the legal tender stipulation in the Contracts Clause of the U.S. Constitution. Dr. Ron Paul has delivered over 5,000 newborn babies into life in this world, and he believes each of their minds began to form at the moment of conception, when their father's sperm impregnated itself into their mother's ovum. If there were any form of real religion anymore these days, Ron Paul would not just be a saint, he would be the living pope of it. Ideological Differences one could argue that everything Ron Paul has ever said might be a lie that he personally does not truly believe in, in which he only says to play the role of devil's advocate within the system of the New World Order's de facto present global government, the U.S. Empire. This argument, prima facie, is absurdist because the same argument can be applied a la Descartes' methodologies to the biblical word of God, and thus one would arrive at applying radical doubt to the very voice that gives us reason and reality, destroying our blind faith in a supreme being by replacing the concept of God as a reasonable, negotiable personality with the insanity of a lunatic demon. As the Golden Age Greek saying goes, when Zeus is toppled, the chaos rules and whirlwind reigns. In short, when a doctor comes to offer you medicine, you can choose whether to accept what he is offering you or not, but you should not blame the doctor for simply trying to do his job by offering it to you. The doctor is not your enemy in this case. He is trying to help. Therefore, he is acting as your friend. Ron Paul is definitely on the right side of history in his words and deeds. If these alone are not enough testimony of the man's innermost mind and heart, then let your heart be eased by this. I will vouch for him. In my personal opinion, Ron Paul is the real deal. He truly believes in and means what he says. This should be a great relief, although, as I say also, I fear it falls on too many deaf ears as simply being preaching to the choir of the poor while being ignored by the rich elite. Therefore, if we proceed with the assumption behind us that Ron Paul is the sole exception to that old rule about there being not one honest politician, then we can begin to look at some of the areas where he has already and is currently making headway in his struggle against the New World Order. Primary among these philosophical differences occurs between Dr. Paul's libertarian, limited government, maximum individual liberty politics, and Austrian free market gold coin economics, and the Keynesian statist supply side economics and corporatist funded globalist, all of the protocols of Zion, politics of the New World Order. Ron Paul has repeatedly encouraged people to read economic books by authors other than those who are the only ones taught in U.S. universities such as the Austrian school including Ludwig von Mises, and he has given his highest recommendation to the elegantly oversimplified On the Law by Frederick Bastiat, from which the libertarians draw the definition of government as state violence. Some of Ron Paul's seemingly grandiose but actually quite achievable campaign promises have included being able to reduce the income tax rate to 0%, to make gasoline cost one dime a gallon, and to reduce the size of the Federal Register or law books of the U.S. federal government, all within his first year in the office of president. 
Again, these claims may sound fantastical and bizarre to someone conditioned to believe we need to pay taxes, that gas prices will always inflate, and that the government will always write more and more draconian laws incrementally encroaching into our every last personal private space. Nevertheless, they are possible, at least at this point in time. If Ron Paul wins the Republican nomination in the general election for President of the USA. Points of Contention Ron Paul's liberty message could not be more opposite from the outlines for a new world order expressed in the protocols of the learned elders of Zion. The handbook adhered to, whether admittedly or knowingly, or in secret, or unawares, by all the New World Order globalist rich elites today. Ron Paul's appreciation of Zionism as the movement for an Israeli state in Palestine is vastly knowledgeable, and based entirely on factual historical events. The Protocols, on the other hand, were falsely attributed to the early Zionist movement by anti-Jewish proto-Bolsheviks in Russia while it was still Tsarist. The authentic origins of the Protocols are not yet now known, and the identity of their original author remains a secret known to, if any, only a very small number of people alive on this planet at this time right now. On the other hand, the sources for Ron Paul's ideological beliefs are public figures, well-known and, for the most part, well-received the world over, including the framers or founding fathers of the U.S. Constitution, including Jefferson, Franklin, and Washington, and the founders of the free market and Austrian schools of economics, namely Adam Smith and later Hayek, von Mises, etc., while the protocols outline a methodology of hoarding gold in banks to gradually remove it from currency circulation, Ron Paul, the framers of our nation, Adam Smith, and other free market capitalists have all advocated to limit the size of private corporations by circulating the maximum amount of gold and silver as coined currency possible. In short, the New World Order's protocols, dating back to no sooner than the turn of the 20th century, the earliest years of the 1900s, are actually a younger, retrogressive movement against the older, more libertarian movement toward personal liberty as an inalienable human right, established during the later years of the 18th century, the mid-1700s. The difference between a globalist one-man dictatorship outlined in the protocols and the U.S. Democratic Republic form of government laid out in the Declaration of Independence, Constitution of the USA, and the Bill of Rights and Additional Amendments, is the difference between the New World Order on the one hand and Ron Paul on the other. If you believe a global empire under a single-person hegemon is preferable to the current condition of the U.S. formed as a union of states under a single federal level of government, as far as I am concerned, you should shoot yourself now before a more liberty-minded patriot has to do it for you. For the most part, the minds of most real people are already made up, and they are unanimously dead set against any further extension of the powers of the U.S. federal government. The TSA and DHS, along with all the other offices established or granted additional authority by the USA Patriot Act should be repealed. Obama should be tried for the war crime of drone bombing unarmed and unaware innocent civilians in Pakistan, no less so than should George W. Bush be tried for his crimes against humanity in Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as at other black sites used in his extraordinary rendition program for torturing detainee POWs in the invasions of those sovereign nations. Ron Paul is pretty much 100% the ideological opposite of George W. Bush in every way that Barack Obama is the physical opposite of W. Jr. Points of Direct Contention The question is occasionally begged in the MSM regarding their non-issue of Ron Paul's electability. 
if he has ever gotten any bills passed. The pundits are quick to agree with one another that it would be worth finding out, but they never follow up on it. In truth, Ron Paul was the original author of what became the later imbalanced and ultimately top-heavily draconian anti-Wall Street high-risk lending regulations of the Dodd-Frank bill. When Ron Paul wrote the original framework for this legislation, it was simply not called Dodd-Frank. It was called Audit the Fed, and under the final passage of Dodd-Frank, a partial audit of the Federal Reserve was conducted by the GAO on top of the regular annual in-house inventories, supposedly conducted by the Fed within its own vaults, or rather its own accounting ledgers. The lending practices revealed by this partial audit provided better insight into the high-risk international bank loans the Federal Reserve was also issuing out simultaneously to its redistributing the federal government's income from taxes into the big bank bailout of 2009 to its remaining FDIC member-insured banking subsidiaries. As it turned out in later subcommittee hearings held by Ron Paul as a member of the Congressional House of Representatives, the Federal Reserve lent out over one billion U.S. dollars to European central banks in Greece, Germany, France, Spain, and the Swiss Netherlands to sustain the controlled collapse of the euro, which has begun in Greece with the massively unpopular cuts to their retirement austerity programs as a means of paying down the Greek national debt to the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank. Of course, no one dares mention such things as debt forgiveness or reneging on payment, and instead the finer options of complex wholesale laws wrought on the vine, while only the larger, much uglier options, such as national bankruptcy or alternatively a run on the banks, are seen and considered by the elders of the New World Order planning bodies and steering committees. If, for example, it were assumed that multinational organizations like the UN, the EU, and NATO, NGOs like the IMF and World Bank, as well as national government administrations, under any form of political party Democrat or Socialist or Republican or Fascist, etc., ought to all be working together for the mutual benefit of them all, rather than of only one of them at the expense of all the others. They should not be competing with one another's populations over who controls whose natural resources. That's simply foolish, and the entire military-industrial complex is founded on that simple premise. If you see war for what it is, the ecosystem's self-digestion like a giant hungry stomach, then you should seek to find a way to feed this emptiness rather than simply just attack it. War eats soldiers and, like a flickering candle snuffed out in a sudden gust of wind, blinks their hopeful lives out of existence in the bat of an eyelash. War is the insatiable inversion of equally limitlessly lush natural abundance. When there is a surplus of resources for all to share, there is no competition over them leading to war. To break the stranglehold of armchair industrialists and energy barons over the R&D testing done for and with the U.S. DOD's deployed military forces, Ron Paul intends to simply override any naysaying by generals embedded in hot zones about leaving, and to, on day one, bring all the troops home. Ron Paul will end the constant conflict begun by Karl Rove, but the dates back to even prior to Nixon's administration, with the declaration of U.S. troop commitment to the Korean national conflict under U.N. resolution. Points of potential further contention. The obvious point is differing with the New World Order on the issue of the use of war, which Ron Paul believes should only ever be constitutional, meaning declared by the Congress, never by the executive branch. Unlike Hillary Clinton, for example, 
Ron Paul is not an international affairs bully, itching to start a fight with any Mideast nation and to extradite Julian Assange of WikiLeaks and to charge him with a thought crime as an enemy of the state in the U.S. Ron Paul is for allowing Iran to continue developing its nuclear power plant program as well as for allowing Israel to bomb Iran's nuclear waste storage facilities as potentially weaponizable levels of uranium enrichment all without U.S. involvement at all in the affairs of either nation. And when it comes to Julian Assange, Ron Paul stands beside both the right of Assange to publish the material once leaked and of the Internet to freely redistribute it. The other obvious point of difference between Ron Paul and the New World Order is Paul's repeated attacks on the Federal Reserve Bank, not only on its myopically limited methodology of inflation of sector bubbles, by keeping interest rates artificially low, but against the entire premise of the need for it to exist, being an investment and loans rather than commodities and savings bank. The institution of the Fed itself is, to be blunt, how the rich elites fund their black budget R&D by laundering the government funds collected by the IRS from the U.S. citizens as taxes which, in turn, is how the rich elite continue to leech their imaginary authority off the individual citizens of the USA. The issue of whether taxation is necessary under a U.S. federal-level government that has been scaled down to solely offices justifiable by the original Constitution of the USA is a good debate, or would be if the average U.S. citizen assumed taxation weren't mandatory, as they do, but optional, as it in fact is. However, besides attacking the rich elite's pro-war ideology, as well as threatening to cut off their funding and its source by petitioning the audit with the ultimate intention to end the Fed, there are further points of contention between Ron Paul and the New World Order. Libertarianism, if indeed Ron Paul's philosophy, when taken to its ultimate extent, advocates the same goal in the end as Marxist socialist communism that is, an anarchist utopia. Now, free market capitalism and a revolutionary multinational dictatorship by the proletariat might disagree about which road to take to get there, but they agree their destination is the same place. Thus, ultimately, Ron Paul's ideals are, in their peak, alike those of Barack Obama, a socialist, and Mitt Romney, a corporatist, and they all believe they are doing their personal best to achieve the same end, an anarchist utopia. Results of Contentions Thus far, the New World Order has succeeded in introducing spin onto every direct attack by Ron Paul. The 2008 election cycle came down to him running out of money, the audit the Fed bill evolved into Dodd-Frank and yielded only a partial, though nonetheless shocking, audit. The 2012 presidential campaign is currently in an upheaval following mass arrests made at multiple state convention level caucuses that had turned into what could only be described as Ron Paul rallies, with so many supporters showing up that it caused the conventions to be shut down. Followed immediately in the MSM by Rand Paul, Ron's son, the Republican senator from Kentucky, announcing that Ron Paul was conceding the nomination and that Rand was now supporting Mitt Romney for the Republican presidential candidate. There has been little or no word from Ron Paul nor his immediate campaign staff on these issues in the last few days since this all occurred. Gerald Salente, the trends predictor I mentioned briefly earlier, was interviewed by AM and Web InfoWars host Alex Jones on these matters, and Salente replied in brief that Obama would win if put head-to-head -head against Romney, but that he hoped Ron Paul's endorsement does not mean that Ron Paul is completely out of the race. In truth, there has been a barrage of behind-the-scenes action on behalf of the Ron Paul campaign staff to make certain that, regardless of who else knows, the delegates sent from the states to the RNC will know that once they are there, they are legally unbound and can vote for any of the nominees, not only who their state bound them to vote for in their state primaries. This will make the RNC a very controversial event in the MSM, but more importantly, it could mean a very 
strong chance for Ron Paul to win the Republican Party nomination for their candidate for president. If this occurs, there is every hope in the world that Ron Paul will win the presidency of the U.S. and succeed in accomplishing his Reform America Now platform. However, ultimately, the cause is greater than any one man alone, and so we can only keep our hope alive that such an outcome as this continues to remain possible for now. Results prior to the 2012 election As I said, the Audit the Fed bill was watered down, but did arm Congressman Ron Paul with enough ammo to continue his attacks on their fiat counterfeit system. As mentioned during the big bank bailout era and in specific during the same lending window as TARP, the Toxic Asset Repossession Program, the Fed loaned between 10 billion and 15 billion US dollars to various EU nation central banks which we can say in hindsight pushed the loans of many of these nations up to levels requiring them to reform their national budgets, resulting in their cutting retirement funding austerity programs, which in turn has led to the ongoing riots. So, aside from Ron Paul exposing the Fed's initiating role in the European debt crisis, he has been able to accomplish little in preventing it from having occurred, but likewise has in no way benefited from it having done so either. Ron Paul, perhaps alone in Washington, D.C., is not to blame for the European debt crisis. He predicted it, and has predicted a return to a gold-based economic currency exchange method all along. And when these things inevitably occur, regardless of taxpayers trusting the Fed, and when regardless of the Fed exercising all its tools to postpone them, hyperinflation and the collapse of the dollar end up happening anyway, we should not blame Ron Paul for warning us. Ron Paul's devotion to the cause of liberty and truth is inspirational to everyone, and this includes the OWS movement, the Tea Party movement, C4L and Y4L, We Are Change, InfoWars, WikiLeaks, Anonymous, and everybody else alive right now. You cannot change, you cannot reduce, you cannot subtract from this fact. The course of history is changed by Ron Paul. But whether the course of history will be changed for the better or not, this depends, not on Ron Paul nor anyone on his side of the fence. It depends on the elder, richest elite in the globalist new world order, because unless they surrender, then there will be a global revolution, what the new world order has long prepared for in the form of World War III. Potential Results post-2012 election. I have often written elsewhere about the twin dimensions of heaven and hell beyond our own. Suffice it to say, I take it as common knowledge by now that some places at some times are better or worse than others at the same time or even in the same place at a different time. This is due to the presence or absence of one or both of these extra dimensions beyond our own. When the situation is good, the heaven dimension is at play, and when things are bad, it is the hell dimension that is closer at hand. These observations in themselves are obvious enough to anyone. However, understanding how and why things are sometimes good here, other times bad there, etc., requires patience. It takes a long time to fully understand the cycles and patterns behind natural events. For example, in the year 1999, many people believed that the world would spontaneously end on midnight January 1st, 2000. There was a strong superstition that the millennium date would hearken in the so-called end of days, prophesied by every religion ever dreamt up by humanity. It did not. Instead, on May 5th, 2000, Seven planets, including Earth and the Moon, aligned with the Sun in the constellation Taurus, the Grand Cross, and no Earth-shattering event occurred. So, in frustration that the Earth did not just explode of its own accord, the New World Order cabal staged the election of October 2000 by Fox News announcing the Florida vote count too close to call, and thus forcing a protracted recount process 
after which the Supreme Court simply appointed George Bush Jr. to the office of U.S. President, in spite of the recount never being completed. Then, on September 11, 2001, they staged a false flag terrorist attack on the USA, and the rest has become indelibly blooded into the pages of history. Through this series of events, we can clearly watch the wax and wane, the rise and fall of good and evil, as the heaven and hell dimensions have crossed through into our own, either more or less at the various points in time. Between the seven planetary grand cross of 5-5-2000 and the alignment of the Earth, Sun, and galactic core in the direction of the constellation Sagittarius on December 21, 2012, the heaven and hell dimensions have been approaching their maximum amount of effect and influence on our own reality here on Earth. From the 21st of December this year until April 15th, 2029, these heaven and hell dimensions will be waning away and diminishing their influence on this reality we experience here on Earth. Finally, after April 15th, 2029, they will have completely split apart due to the event of the asteroid Apophis 99942 colliding with the Earth in one reality on that date.